who do you think got the better score on step one? You have a 50-50 chance of getting this right. Very right, Meryl. And you know why I'm convinced she did better? Is because she reads so carefully. So if you can do one thing for yourself as you study for this exam, I want you to teach yourself to slow down and be calm as you approach a question. Because one time reading through carefully is a hundred times better than reading it rapidly, skimming it and mixing, missing things, and having to go back and read it again. Read it once, carefully, and well. Now, now that we've noticed that there's much more reading to be done, I want to show you our certified approach to questions that you'll see again if you come to our webinar on Friday with Dr. Tisdall, who of course is the master of this. What you wanna do when you look at a question, and again, do it carefully and slowly, a 20-year-old male college student presents to the university health clinic for complaining that he has quote unquote, the sorest throat of his life and is tired all the time. Notice the use of quotation marks. One of the important primary care issues with physicians is you have to get used to interpreting what your patient is telling you about their condition. Patients do not come into your office and say, doctor, I have pharyngitis and lymphadenopathy. They come in and they say what they're feeling. And so you have to interpret that. And I always want you to start with the concept of who it was who walked in your door. In this case, age, gender. And we're going to also ask ourselves about the time frame for this chief complaint age of patient, gender of patient, and time frame of the chief complaint. Well, the chief complaint, as you see, is given in the patient's words. So you have a first step in this style of question in interpreting what the patient is saying to you. From there, they're gonna give you ancillary information. Some of it is gonna end up being useful to you, some of it is not. Read it carefully and think about it. So this patient has been sexually active for the past several months with multiple partners. On examination, he has a temperature of 100 degrees, uh, 0.4 Fahrenheit or 38 centigrade. Oropharynx has a white exudate, marked enlargement of the tonsils and enlargement of the posterior cervical lymph nodes, okay? Now, as we're thinking about the age group here, and some of you may have heard this in class today with Dr. Tisdall, realize that if we compartmentalize patients into what's the most likely problem within their age group, for an individual from birth to the age of 20, you might put into your mind quickly thoughts of genetic or developmental problems. As they launch into their 20s and up until, say, 60 or so, they'll have things that they've done to them, infectious diseases or exposures or some sort of injury. And then as we get above 60 and beyond, we start thinking about genetic or developmental. So the age group of this individual makes me think about things that have been exposures. Now, notice that I underlined the posterior cervical lymph nodes, because if I'm thinking about how a patient is going to respond to something that gets into their body from saliva of others, then what's going to happen is that the infection in the pharynx is going to be managed by the lymph nodes that drain that area. So anatomically thinking, you would be going for, okay, tonsils, obviously, that's the drainage of the area from the throat. But 
how am I getting posterior or auricular nodes involved? That implies that there has been systemic spread. So this is not an infection that is confined to the oropharynx, but one that has instead spread through other tissues and is involving us, okay? Involving other areas, okay? Now, what do you think about this temperature? Does this fever imply to you something that is very highly inflammatory with lots of neutrophils and lots of production of interleukin-1 and lots of fever? What do you think? Is that a very high fever or sort of a meh fever? Good job, Danielle. See how much better you do with me than we, when you're trying to tease Dr. Tisdall? Exactly right. It's just not a very exciting fever. It's certainly a fever. But remember that what causes fever is changes in the hypothalamic temperature set point. And interleukin-1, when produced in the body, carried to the hypothalamus, acts through prostaglandins to cross the barrier and to stimulate a change in the set point. So think about the fact that if an infectious disease causes a tremendous amount of interleukin-1 production, I'm gonna to tend to have a very high fever. If there is not as much interleukin-1 production, I'm gonna have a lower one. So I'm already thinking with this presentation that I've got a viral pharyngitis. I obviously could have had a bacterial pharyngitis or a viral one, and they would both be in my differential list. But the temperature here is implying to me that this is viral. The fact that I'm seeing lymph nodes that are outside of the normal drainage flow of the throat is also making me think viral. And when I come to the point where I see that this patient has a soft ab uh, abdomen with a palpable splenic tip. I'm saying not only has it made it to lymph nodes that are outside the drainage of the throat, this has gotten into the system-wide circulation. This is not classic for bacterial pharyngitis. So I'm really leaning very strongly toward etiology. Now notice what they've done next, which is a sort of sneaky thing for them to do. The liver is mildly enlarged and tender to palpation. Well, if you're not thinking about the body's natural response to a viral infection, then you might very quickly make the mistake of asking yourself the question of whether or not this could be a case of viral hepatitis. But what is it that the liver does every day in order to keep you healthy that would make me not be surprised that the liver is tender to palpation? What does your liver do? It filters from the gastrointestinal tract. What else, Danielle? Putting you on the spot now. And other people can answer. Okay, Kupfer cells eat red blood cells. Does that have anything to do with mononucleosis? Metabolizes drugs. Do we have any drugs here, guys? Think about this patient. Detox, all of these things are true. <laughs> you haven't given him any drugs yet, Meryl. That's right. <laughs> Well, guys, have you heard of something called the acute phase reaction? Where do acute phase reactants come from? The liver, that's exactly right. So if I have a liver that is responding to things that as you said, it's detoxifying out of the blood, it's cleaning things out, the response of putting a whole wave of reactants into the bloodstream that function in increasing the immune response eventually, 
is a perfectly normal thing for the liver to do. How am I going to tell the difference between a patient who actually has an infection of their liver, hepatitis, and someone who simply has the liver doing what the liver should be doing in a case of a system-wide infection? How am I gonna tell the difference? There you go, there you go. The liver function test, right? So now what I want you to do, having thought to this point, is think about what tests you would want to order in order to distinguish and perhaps rule in or rule out the various things you're thinking about. We've got bacterial pharyngitis, still on the list, we haven't ruled it out. We've got viral pharyngitis of some systemic sort. And we've got the possibility of hepatitis that we just wanna make certain is not going to wipe out and slap us in the face after we've made our clever diagnosis of something else. We're covering the bases. And I want you then realizing that they will show you all of these chem panels and differentials. I want you to be thinking about how you're gonna manage them quickly. Yes, Alex, okay. The key with fever is that it is caused by interleukin-1. And so as a generality, bacterial infections will cause a higher fever because of the fact that they attract a multitude of neutrophils, which then start the production of interleukin-1 from the endothelium and release it themselves. Now, there are certainly viruses that will cause high fevers as well. So I can't do it absolutely, but I can probably do it fairly grossly, starting with a pharyngeal infection. The bacterial pharyngeal infection would tend to have a higher fever than the viral ones, okay? So it's a question of how much interleukin-1 is stimula stimulated by the pathogen, okay? Now, back to our metabolic panel here. Train yourself to read these quickly. They'll be in the same order, but every doctor, every day of practice is going to be confronted with dozens, if not double dozens of these to look at every day. So you need to start getting good at it. Now, I sort of cheated here and highlighted the things I wanted you to notice. With that ALT and A, ST, what do you think about that and the potential diagnosis for hepatitis? Can we rule that in or rule that out? Rule it in, Merrill says. Mm, is that a high AST or ALT? It's certainly elevated. There you go. You had a 50-50 chance and now Milan got it, okay? You can rule it out at that level. That simply is not a high enough elevation. It will be 20 times normal, okay? There you go, exactly. Even more than hundreds, Meryl. I mean, if it's a hepatitis, it will be a dramatic increase. I wouldn't have expected you to to necessarily know that yet, but you're at the beginning of your study. So you're gonna to start to get these numbers in your head quickly so that you can look at them and say, yeah, that's pretty dramatic. I need to look at that, okay? Everything else here, I didn't highlight because I'm not seeing any elevation that's worth worrying about. But when I look at my results of my CBC, notice that the type of cell that's elevated is my lymphocyte. Okay, now that should be an important point for you to understand immunologically. Bacteria by and large are responded to by neutrophils. Viruses are responded to by lymphocytes. Now there are certainly lymphocytes turned on to certain components of bacteria and so forth. But remember that that key transition between what we call a humoral immune response and production of antibodies and a cell mediated response and the production of killer T cells depends on these lymphocytes. 
So we're going to have these elevated and the fact that we have such an elevation here and a slight elevation, but not really very noticeable in the neutrophils pretty much pushes me away from a bacterial pharyngitis and into a viral one. Now, looking at the differential of what types of lymphocytes these were, notice that the elevation of those atypical lymphocytes, which are my killer T cells, and in some degrees, my natural killers as well, pretty much cinches this as a viral infection. Okay, now let's stop for a minute and think about how long it took us to get there. Now, I've worked step by step, and I'm sure some of you out there are thinking, oh my God, I can't take 10 minutes on every question. But realize the value of practicing with questions, either in class or out of class, is to get yourself a facility for looking through a scenario and thinking logically about your next steps. You will absolutely get better with time. I'm not encouraging you to get to the place where you skim because I've already told you, careful and thoughtful is the way to go at these. But it's certainly true that you will get better and faster as you think through the process of the patient. Age, gender, time frame. what's most likely? Chief complaint, where am I? What organ systems could be affecting this? What are the clues in the case history that I'm given? What are the clues in the tests that I'm given? And you'll find that after a while, you'll come up with your diagnosis and then you'll be ready to make the answer of the question. But you have gotta admit, this is a much more complex process. And is there anyone out there watching tonight who thinks that you could have solved this by memorization? There are things that you memorize to get to this point, but they are really testing on whether or not you're thinking like a doctor. That is the skill that they're trying to focus on. Now, you haven't even seen the question yet, okay? We've gotten through our differential short list. We've gotten through the tests. Here finally is the question. Latex agglutination for serum heterophile antibodies is negative. Holy guacamole, okay? Well, you, I am sure, if you are a normal human being, and I'm sure you all are, we're thinking that the next step after all of that stuff they gave you would be to look at the results of a monospot, right? Well, they're not going to give you monospot as an option because that is a buzzword and they will expect you to know what the monospot does. The monospot is an agglutination test for serum heterophile antibodies. That's the monospot and they're telling you it's negative. It's the come to Jesus moment now, guys. Are you going to look at this and say, all of that time I painstakingly went through this question, I made the wrong diagnosis and now I've got to go back and start over? Or are you going to say to yourself, I did this right, I thought through it carefully, so there has to be another reason why the monospot is negative? Well, if you notice, the monospot is a heterophile antibody test. That means it's not measuring antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus. It's measuring antibodies against something cross-reactive. In this case, it happens to be sheep red blood cells. Sheep red blood cells have nothing to do with your getting mono. You don't get it from sheep. It's just an accidental cross-reactivity that makes the test simple, easy, and cheap. But there are so many false negatives in heterophile tests that you must know as a physician that your next step is to look specifically for the virus or some component of the virus. 
And notice the only thing out of this list that you needed to remember is that it's a DNA virus that you're looking for the capsid for. If you notice, going back here for a minute, well, it's gonna be difficult for me to go back, but remember that horrifying qu question I showed you that had double-stranded DNA and icosahedral and nucleic and uh, um, nuclear membrane, all of that stuff in it? Off of that entire list, today's test question is only asking you to remember it's a DNA virus. And that's why I'm so certain that a lot of the memorization is gonna go away. The physician of today and tomorrow is gonna operate with their computer in their hand and they will look up purely memorizational things. The only difference between you as a physician and everybody else in the medical team, the nurses, the PAs, the nurse practitioners, the difference for you is they want you to be able to logically think. They don't care how much you've memorized. They want you to problem solve, okay? So start to recognize that not all facts are created equal. Now, step two is simply another transition in the process. Now my question is even much bigger. I've got a huge amount of information in it, okay? keeping some of the same attributes with the patient explaining their problem in a way that you have to interpret. Notice this list of things that they tell you that really in the end are not gonna be important to your ultimate diagnosis and solution to the problem. But patients are patients and will tell you things you need to know and things you don't need to know. And so you need to learn to be a filter, okay? So some of this material is not going to help me. And notice that the question, after a very prolonged breakdown of information that includes a complete phys 